I had the pleasure to have a conversation with Peter Anthony, and he is the perfect speaker to be here right after lunch. I think you'll find him to be dynamic and entertaining. He is going to be giving us a presentation called Back in a Minute. His NDE gave him the gifts of being an author, a numerologist, and now paranormal investigator. So would you please give a warm welcome to Peter Anthony, our ambassador of love and light. I'm Peter Anthony. I'm a life coach, a psychic, an author of several books, and a paranormal expert. Why is the city of Palm Springs, California overabundant with paranormal activity? We are here to find out why. Legendary yeah. movie stars yeah. used to live here. Right here is known as Ghost Alley. I think they're unsettled spirits and maybe they just have unfinished business here. Something's trying to get my attention. I definitely know that something happened here. It's like I sense death. This place is haunted. As soon as I touch the door, bam, this cold energy goes right through me. The first thing I sense is murder or death. And what I'm seeing, it's not water, it's blood. What noises do you hear? Like little clicking and like, like scratches on walls. Kind of. Yeah, scratching on the walls is usually a haunting. Yeah. I'm standing here in front of a haunted toy store. Wait till you see what's inside. Well, what we have here is, we call it Ghost Alley, and it starts over at Willow Mansion, works all the way over to the Indian Burial Ground on Takowitz. And for some reason, we have three hauntings here, and your store being one of those. This little girl that I'm picking up on, I can still feel her She's presence. She's still here. She's still here, yeah. Can't remember the young boy that worked here? Nick. Nick. Mm -hmm. For some reason, she didn't like him. That's when everything started happening, when he was here. You know, I'd asked you before to keep that room locked. And you've kept it locked? Yeah. Okay, she's here. Seeing it scratches. Normally what happens when a spirit's trying to get out and you lock it, they scratch the door trying to get out. Where are they? Whoa. What I want to do here sometimes is come here at nighttime oh, because that's yeah. when the spirits are active. Um, hold on a second. She's going through me right now as we speak. She doesn't want me to hold these. She wants you to have them. Movie moguls, movie stars, and mobsters made Palm Springs. Palm Springs is known for its legendary movie stars and its legendary movie colony. But what about the legendary movie stars that haunt these mansions? Hello? Hello? Something's going on here. Palm Springs Police Department, is anybody here? I've been in some places where you just can't explain things or, or whatever, and you, you don't you get a kind of, Do you get a kind of weird feeling sometimes when you go in these places? I don't know what happened well, here. sometimes you can walk in and you can just feel some heaviness. My job is to help motivate my clients to help them put their lives back together again. Think with my heart and my head. Give me your hands. We'll follow. I promise. Helping the living is just as important as helping the deceased. You have to believe. I know. As a paranormal expert, I'm called in to the most unlikely places. Even deceased spirits need to be coached to the other side. Surprised? I am too. Hi, I'm Peter Anthony, and welcome here to Saturday Afternoon. What I learned as a paranormal investigator, that everything begins with light and ends with light. I learned that from my near-death experience, and I learned that, and I learned that as a paranormal investigator. I'd like to thank all of you for being here on Saturday Afternoon, and I'm going to share a little bit about my story. And I've been traveling for the last couple of years, uh, on a book tour. And one of the most common questions that's asked as I'm on this book tour is how can you go from the news division at CBS and end up becoming one of the country's youngest paranormal investigators? 
Well, I'm going to share that story with you. And it's just what I think is a bit of my history to help you understand all about the gifts that happened to us on the other side. 1987, November the 11th, the nurse is rolling me down the hospital corridor. He's suited up as though I'm radioactive, mask, gloves, just fearful. Back in the 1980s, in fact, in 1987, we're in the height of the AIDS epidemic. I came into the hospital from a CBS rap party, and that's when everything kind of went cattywampus. I began to bleed in my suit, and I excused myself from the rap party, and I went home and put on some thrift clothes because I didn't want my suit and my nice clothes to be bloodied. And when I got into the hospital at the admitting area, they refused to check me in. And at that time of our consciousness, that's just where people were. People were dying. We didn't know what happened back then at that period of time. They just assumed it was airborne or you could get it from just touching blood. And here I was in a hospital bleeding. I had lost a lot of weight. And I had these brown lesions on my face. Didn't know what they were. So they were reluctant to check me in. So as the nurse is reeling me down towards the ER and the OR room, I reached up and I asked her, so what's wrong with me? And I could feel the pain in my stomach. It was unbearable. And he looked down at me and he was just shaking. And he looked around and found an empty hallway and pushed my gurney and me into an area where no one could find me and ran away and left me there to die. Now, I can't blame him, and I certainly cannot blame the medical crew, yes, that's where we were. But if you go back to the Ebola plague a couple of years ago, same thing. Our media had hyped it up so much. So as I sit in that corridor all by myself, bloodying my thrift clothes, not realizing that changing into thrift clothes kind of changed the equation. I actually had created my own death sentence. No one would come near me. They assumed that I was homeless. They assumed that I was in the final stages of AIDS. And then finally, God showed up. God showed up. This nurse came in through the exit door, saw me on the gurney, and she came up to me and approached me and she said, what are you doing here? And the closer she got, she realized, oh my God, what's wrong with you? And she kept backing away and backing away and backing away. I said, come back, I need help. And she just kept her distance. She said, well, where, where, aren't you supposed to be in the ER or the OR? And I said, well, someone just left me here. And something took over kindness. I could see it in her eyes, and she walked back. She said, okay, I'll take care of this. And she reeled me down, and I'll never forget this, to prep me for to go into surgery. And she put me in a cubicle, number 11. And I sat in this little, small little cubicle, and I could hear the doctors and the nurses arguing. And one of the doctors opened up the curtain, looked at me, looked at the blood, looked at her, closed the curtain, and said, Sullivan, what have you done? What have you done? You've exposed us to the AIDS virus. This man is homeless, he's gay, and he's dying, and you've exposed us to the AIDS virus, and they left. They left me and Nurse Sullivan in cubicle 11. She came in, she looked at me, she said, I'll be right back. She came back with the gown, she took my clothes off, she scrubbed my body, she came back with mop and soap water, and she scrubbed those floors and said, I'm gonna take care of you. So she got that area all cleaned up, no mask, she was just fearless, she was brave. She didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know that I had tuberculosis, nor did she. I didn't know that I was, had Crohn's disease, nor did she. And I didn't know that I was about to have a perforated viscous, a ruptured intestinal intestine. So here I am being social profiled in this hospital. And she got this gurney and she took me to the OR and she walked in there and I could see because it was just these windows, you could see the, the surgeons in there and they're arguing saying no. And she made sure that they took care of me and she came out and as she was talking to me I could feel myself going in and out of consciousness. And it was at this time that I began to see 
worlds within worlds within worlds. I could see former doctors and nurses, ghosts they were, walking down the corridors as though this was just normal. And I could see them walking between the real doctors and nurses. Dimensions within dimensions, that very thin veil that we don't see because our logic does not allow us to see. And I was watching this going, I think I'm going crazy. But I was watching this, and they, she, Sullivan came out. She said, you're in good hands now. And I went into the OR, and then things just kind of went slow. I could see everything going in slow motion, like as though someone just touched the pause button on the DVD player. Sound became muted. It was just all this stuff around me just operating at a snail's pace. And over here in the far corner, I could see this rotating circle. I call it the bullseye. I didn't know what, at the time what was going on. You're, at that time, I was agnostic. I didn't believe in any stuff. I mean, you live, you die, you make money, boom, end of story. But I saw this tunnel. So ghost, tunnel, had no idea, thinking, what, are, what have they given me? And I'm watching this tunnel. And it was at this time I could see myself hovering over my body. And up here, Peter Anthony, that I am, essence, spirit, if it will, looking down at Peter physical. And I could watch all this activity going on. And it was at this time that I started, I guess, floating around the hospital. I don't have time to go into today, but I went up to the seven floors and many other floors, and I would see all the spirits operating as though this was just a normal world for them, walking in and out rooms. And I came back to the OR. I, I, I guess I, I didn't know what was going on. And I came back, and I remember this very moment. They were trying to hook me up to the IV, and the doctor was screaming at the anesthesiologist. And he said, put those those IVs in him, now, we need it now. We can't, his veins keep collapsing. They turn me over my side, and five, four, three, two, boom. The tunnel back, lights everywhere. And as I looked over this tunnel, I was here, and I could see them going with these shock paddles. Stand back, clear, boom, I watched my body bounce. I looked over here at the rotating tunnel, and I could see people that I knew, that I recognized. I could see aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, but not my brothers and sisters and aunts and uncle and father from this current lifetime. It was past life, people coming to greet me at this tunnel, welcome, come, smiling. There were no words, but yet we were communicating. Here, I know you've heard that many speakers have taught, there's this telepathic communication that goes on, but you feel and sense everything. And I went into the tunnel, and it was at this moment, as I'm spiraling around this tunnel, I began to see quantum physics, mathematical equations. Now, you're talking to someone who was a special effects makeup artist, all right? So math in my world at that time just wasn't my thing. But I could see all these mathematical formulas, and I was digesting each equation as though it made sense. I could also see the numbers 222, 333, 444, 555, 999, 1111, 111, all these numbers all circling around me in colors, in sound, in music, I cannot explain today. I, even in the book, I do not do it justice. And people say they love this part of the book. It, to me, I just did the very best I could to go back to that particular moment. But as I'm spiraling around and seeing all these numbers, I go out at the end of this tunnel, and I met, and I say met by an ascended master because I didn't know what else to call it. Not that I knew he was an ascended master. It wasn't until later on when I started doing lectures about my near-earth experience, and so when, oh, that was an ascended master, I'm like, oh, okay, well, sure. But it was my ascended master. And as I was sitting on this tree, in the middle of, I guess, space, a stratosphere, if you will, 
my life review began. Now, from zero to 60, from the time I was born until the time I died at 11.11 p.m. on November the 11th, 1987, for 11 minutes. Think about that. And as I'm sitting here watching all these reviews, you know, it was like this matrix of everything I did. And I can't go into everything. I could probably spend three days talking about my life review, but I will highlight some things I feel are very, very important because they changed me forever. So here I am in high school. My birthday. My sister is at my locker. And I open it. I'm about to close my locker, and there she is. She said, well, today's your birthday. And I said, yeah. And she wants you going to tell me I'm your best friend and how much you love me. And I was like, and I'm looking around, and I have all my football team players over here looking at me. And I was kind of embarrassed, and I didn't want to, oh, go away, you know. Please don't do that, you know. And don't do that. Well, tell me, I'm your best friend. Backstory, my sister was my best friend. We were put in an orphanage during the Christmas holidays at a very young age, just left there like used Kleenex. So I took care of her, and she took care of me. So when I didn't say, I love you, and I'm watching this, that was the night that she was killed by a drunk driver. I never got the chance. I never got the chance to say goodbye. I never got the chance to say I love you. And as I'm watching this, how many times in life, think about this, how many times in life have we had an argument with someone that we love, someone that we care, and our egos get in the way? Or, you know, we're embarrassed because we have our friends over there watching us. That moment for me was a changing moment. It was a changing moment. There is not a day, there is not a day. I've lost my entire family. I lost my family, all of them, by the time I was 21. All of them. So my family are my friends. And everyone knows me that when I say goodbye and I love you, they know that it is coming from an authentic place because I mean it. My next review, also in high school, on my way to my English class, three o'clock, late always, and I see my team players bullying a boy by the name of Mikey. Now, back when I was going to school a long time ago, we didn't have special ed. We had just a, all the special ed, all the Millie Challenge kids were all put in with the PS, public school kids. And so I was watching them bully Mikey. And I'm looking at my watch, knowing that it's 3 o'clock, knowing that I'm late, knowing I get to get to class. And I looked up, and I'm watching this, my review, and looking at Mikey, look at me with those sad eyes, asking for help. And I passed by and did nothing. Nothing. I was forwarded to, just like in a Christmas carol, that shoulda, coulda, woulda moment, when he was crying, and he was talking to his mother, crying, Mommy, Mommy, why do they keep picking on me? And his mother said, because you're special. I saw that. That moment changed me forever. Forever. On my way for CBS interview, I didn't really care if I got the interview because it's not what I really wanted to do, but it was a way to get in the union so I could go become a special effects makeup artist. So, you know, I'd gone six months of being vetted to work, for, uh, you know, for senators and congressmen, first ladies. It just didn't matter to me because it wasn't my ultimate dream. So I'm in my car going over the bridge, final interview, speeding, rock and roll music blaring out of the windows that are open. Open up some gum, put it in my mouth, and I flick out the silver wrapper. And I watch in slow motion the silver wrapper spiraling slowly all the way down into the river. And I watch this gum wrapper go down the river being met by Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, Needles, cat litter, you name it. All this pollution was being accompanied by my silver wrapper. 
And as this collected more and more trash going down the river, then I saw it going through lakes. And I saw it passing an oil refinery. And I watched all the residue, all the toxic energy, all this stuff, this murky stuff, come from the refinery and meet all this trash and go into our oceans. One action. I learned at that moment in life that my small action did affect someone, somewhere, somehow. Think about this. You know, when you cross over, it's not that I murdered someone. It's not that I, you know, robbed a bank. It was those small things in life that we think, no one's looking. Boom, there goes the, the, the rapper. That's what I saw over and over and over. Not voting. Letting someone else's opinion matter more than my own. Not speaking up when I should have. The shouldas, the could and the would have. Over and over and over, I saw this events take place in my life. And then something more amazing happened. I left the life review, and I don't understand why, but it seemed like I was in outer space. I don't want to call it outer space, but it certainly looked like outer space because there were stars and light and planets everywhere. But it was a galaxy, and I'm looking down at Mother Earth, and before me, is this light matter, like sparkling fragments of golden energy just glistering all around me, communicating with me here. Now again, I'm in essence, I'm in spirit form. You see nothing, but yet I feel, touch, smell, everything. Imagine a wolf, an Alaskan wolf in Alaska, morning early, just think of it, early morning, hungry, stalking its prey. Its senses are heightened. That's how it was for me, heightened. And I'm watching this fragment of energy, and I could feel this love and kindness and compassion enter from the back and go out through the solar plexus. And I just felt the most complete love, and the voice began to speak with me. And it was at that moment I realized I was having a conversation with God. It wasn't the man in the beard and the staff. It wasn't any of that. It was energy. It was love. It was compassion. And I got to look down at Mother Earth, and I could see all the atrocities that were being done to our planet. I looked down, and I could see pharmaceutical companies making drugs that cured cancer, but yet created three more diseases. I could see our politicians, not just in America, but all around the world, we were voting, putting people in power who were so eager to take their, their power away from us for the name of profit and greed. Over and over and over, I went from country to state to, to towns all over the world watching a corrupt system that was about to happen and was already happening. Think about that. Our power going to people who use it against us. Sounds pretty current today, doesn't it? Over and over, then I saw the abuse of the animal kingdom. Dolphin, bear, sea lions, walruses, cats, horses. Over and over, I could feel inside of me such compassion, but there wasn't judgment, you guys. There wasn't, look what they're doing and how dare they do this and how, I wasn't angry. I would step back and I could feel compassion. And I also, when I was re reviewing my own life, there wasn't judgment on my part. Peter, you should have been better. Why did you do that? How dare you do that? It was like, you could do a better job, Peter. I was kind to myself. And as I watched event after event after event, poverty, wars, all the stuff that we do to, our, to, to each other, to the planet, it just didn't make sense. And I said, no more, no more. Do you want to go back, the voice said. Do you want to go back? And I have to be honest with you, I'm in this place of peace and harmony. And it's not that I'm going, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I was just, I, my mind is like, I'm floating. I feel great. I feel amazing. And again, just the abuse of the planet. But then something spectacular happened. Something amazing happened. 
I got the chance to see what I call the unsung hero. I got a chance to see doctors, nurses, teachers, housewives, vets, all those people doing deeds that no one else knew about. No one else knew what was going on. Just they were doing their job and doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Over and over in my consciousness, I kept feeling, you do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself that. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Because sometimes what I saw on the other side, I saw myself, I don't want to use the word failing, but just not shining. Just not shining. Do you want to go back? And then I got a chance to see my life, where I was going, what would happen to me. I have to admit to you guys the suicidal thoughts. I was seeing my present life ahead of me, the loneliness, the isolation, all that. But I also saw myself traveling around the planet, talking to people, writing books. Now you're talking and you're hearing someone today who, who's speaking who stuttered. The idea of getting up in, in a room of people, I stuttered. So I couldn't see myself at this point in my life, but I saw it and I thought, oh my God. I got a chance to see what I could do. Do you want to go back, the voice said. Do you want to go back? Yes. And I remember that moment of choice. And this is very important. You know, I write about this in the book. Every day, every moment, every second, we are given a choice. The choice to come here today. The choice to sit where you're sitting. What you decided to wear today. The choice to go to work and or not. The choice to leave an abusive relationship and or a job that you do not like. We are given choice and I was given a choice to go back. It puts the responsibility on our shoulders because it is our choice. And I learned that. And it's valuable to me to this day. And I went back and then it began. I remember when I hit my body. I was unconscious for three and a half weeks. And my best friend would come in and she would read numerology books. And today's lesson is uh, the number one. It's ruled by Aries, and Aries represents, you know, the Daniel Boone. It, it represents the explorer, me, myself, and I. And the number one goes where other people dare not go. Over and over and over, she would read numerology and astrology books to me because that's what she did. That was her passion. So she wanted to share with me, and I would watch hovering over my body, the nurses giggling at her, doctors talking about her. My own doctor came in and said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm reading to him. He well, he can't hear you. Yes, he can. You see, she had a near-death experience, and she knew what was going on. So when I came to, the first thing that happened, the doctor was talking to me. I didn't care what he had to say. Really didn't matter. I knew what happened to me. I asked my friend, I want every numerology book you have, and not the basic numerology books. Bring me everything you have on crossing over. And she said, you died, didn't you? And I said, yes, I did. And I came out of that, I guess to me it felt like coming out of the womb, as it were, coming back as a talker. I just talk, 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 talk. God, this, and he talked to me, and I saw these people, and we were doing this on the planet, and, you know, I can't believe we were doing this. I just kept talking and talking, and everyone kept looking at me like it was a nutcase. The doctors were looking at me like I was just lost my mind. But I also came back with medical knowledge, and I knew that the medicines they were putting inside of me were creating all these harsh reactions. Folks, I mean, Due to the medications, I began to lose my eyesight. The high doses of prednisone they were giving me were creating crippling arthritis. Then I got gout. Then I got a staph infection on my face. They couldn't stop. Just the basic things. They were giving me pain pills. Oh my God, I look like Linda Blair having in a moment on the, on, the, on the table when all these drugs were going inside of me. And I did something smart. 
I told my friend, I said, you know what I need you to do, Wanda? I need you to go, and I want you to bring me back root, garlic, pure aloe vera juice, acidophilus, vitamins, and we're going to wean myself off these medicines. So the doctors would come in, and she would talk to them, and, you know, she was this beautiful, she used to be a model, uh, a former Miss Kansas, and so she would just kind of like bat her eyes and talk to the doctors, and she'd, oh, well, don't worry, he's a good patient, and yes, we'll take those medicines, the nurses would come in, and oh, honey, just, you know, he's an outstanding patient, just give me those meds, and I'll make sure that he has those pills, okay? And we began to wean myself off these medicines. It was the right thing to do. And they came in and said, Mr. Anthony, we have some bad news for you. We're going to have to do another surgery. I said, no, we're not. No, we're not. I knew at that moment, he said, well, we don't. There's not, we can't guarantee that you're going to be living here past three months here. A choice. No. I asked him to bring me what a healthy intestine looked like, with an intestine, the stomach lining, everything. I wanted something I could focus on, something I could see visually. He brought the x-rays in. I looked at the x-rays, put them over here, looked at this, and I put it here on the shelf. And every day I began to visualize a healthy intestine. They kept saying to me, you know, unfortunately, you know, you may not be able to run again due to the Crohn's disease and due to all the side effects we're having with all the medications. And I was sharing with someone, you know, I was on the third floor looking out at a track, and every day my life began five, six, ten miles a day running. So when you tell someone who's been running for a long period of time and ran in college that you'll not be able to run again, that has a huge effect on your consciousness. And every day I would see these interns running on the track, and it really did a number on my head. But I said, I will walk out of this hospital. I hobbled out of that hospital, but I did hobble. But we got off those meds, and my friend sent me to a shaman Indian in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that's where everything changed. Everything changed. Tuberculosis, gone. I was there one week. The Crohn's disease, no more bleeding. The lesions on my face, gone. I was at 89 pounds. I remember when I got to, you know, to 90 pounds, and 92 pounds, and 93 pounds, I was gaining weight. No more bleeding. My life began to change, and I kept talking about my near-death experience, I kept talking, trying to share, and one by one by one, the friends disappeared. Those who used to come and call on me were no longer there. And you know, I kind of get it, because in their world, looking at me, I'm, I might as well have told them, you know what? I died, I met Bigfoot, um, we went up on a UFO, we had dinner, it was lovely, we had a great time, and I came back, and I'm going to tell you all about it. That's how they were looking at me, like I was crazy. So I did not share anymore. From that point on, I began to read. While I was working at CBS, I was doing readings, free of charge, and everyone to me was a research project. So I began to do readings, quiet, don't tell anybody, please. They would start showing up. It just got to the point where Saturdays and Sundays, my day started at 9 and went in at 7. Clients on the hour, showing up over and over. Every Saturday and Sunday, didn't matter where I was, I always came back on weekends and I worked. And that became my new reality. Seven years it took me to process my near-death experience. Reading books, everything I'll get my hand on. And then that moment occurred in my life. When you get that telephone call, that one phone call that changes your entire life forever. Have you had that phone call? Can you think of that? Just that one phone call, bad or good, just raise your hand. One, two, raise your hands high. That one phone call, you know what that one phone call is, right? This phone call for me was, Mr. Anthony, my name is Homicide. I'm not working on Homicide. My name is Detective blah, blah, blah. I can't share his name. And we're working on a case here that involves special effects makeup and also numerology and astrology. We cannot decode this. Hmm. And we need you to go to the crime scene. Would you mind? We cannot figure any of this out. It was an ancient numerology. And what turned out to be the victim when I showed up at the crime scene actually was the serial killer. 
So that entire moment, and I have to share, I'm writing about in my next book, but how I was met by the district attorney, police officers, other detectives, again, in the 90s, we didn't have the medium. Our consciousness was not ready for what I was doing. And I went in and solved the crime, and word got out. I get another phone call, producers from sightings. Mr. Anthony, we hear that you're a great numerologist. We'd like to do you know, a, a test of your psychic abilities. Can you come down? I went down to Paramount Studios, passed the test. Three days later, I'm in Chicago, and I'm working on my first paranormal case of a woman dying of cancer being haunted by shadows. Friday night, the show aired the following week. Boom, my life began. I did all of this until 2007, folks. Numerology readings, no one knew about it other than my clients. Astrology readings, and I traveled around the world as a paranormal investigator, no one knowing what I was doing because I did not want to go through that Bigfoot scenario again. I got caught in 2007. My boss called me in, and she said, I saw you on television. That's you, right? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> You're chasing ghosts, aren't you? Well, okay. And she said, I also understand that you do numerology. And I said, yes. What are you doing? What are you doing? And I, at that moment, I came out of the closet with everything. I gave her one year's notice, and I said, I'm going to write a book. I'm moving back to California. I'm going to travel around the country, and I'm going to lecture and talk about my near-earth experience. And she looked at me as though I was a whack job. You're going to give all this up? I did. I gave it all up. And the reason why I share this with you is because in each and every one of us, we are given a choice. We are here for reasons. Think about that. You are here for a reason, not just to show up as a teacher or a fireman or an attorney or a speaker or a writer, but you have chosen as an enlightened being to shift consciousness. So you were given a choice. And what I found in my own life was I didn't, you know, well, I can't do this because of the money. And I can't do this because I won't be in, getting in a relationship. I kept making these excuses of why I couldn't do it. But the truth and what I saw on the other side just kept moving me forward to my destiny. So I say to all of you in this room, have a choice to do something with your lives. Other than, I mean, it's great to be here. It's great to be motivated here today by all the speakers. What an amazing event this is for all of us. But ask yourself, is there something I should be doing, I want to do, but I'm not doing because of the following? And for me, what I did was very simple. I wrote a list down of what I'm good at. Well, the current list was, I can talk. I can write. I can motivate people. I can inspire people. I'm gifted at numerology. I'm gifted at tarot. I'm gifted at ancient astrology. These are my assets. And what are your, you know, the things you need to work on? I'm afraid of speaking before audiences still. But it's a challenge, isn't it? And that's why I ask each and every one of you in this room, what challenges you? What would you like to do? How would you like to contribute to the shift of consciousness? Because all of us are given gifts. We all have the gifts, and especially right now, there's an SOS from the other side calling us to make a difference now. We need you on the front lines now. So I'm gonna ask you something. Who in this room here feels they're stuck somewhere? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand high, okay. Ask yourself, what's keeping me from doing what I wanna do? Is it money? So raise your hand if it's money. Raise your hand high. Can't pay the bills? Think about that, okay? Maybe I'm afraid to do something. Maybe I'm not good enough. Raise your hand. That was my issue. Who's going to listen to me speak? Who's going to want to hear about my near-earth experience? I mean, when I was writing 
and submitting all my career letters to all the to, to the lit agents and publishers, and I'm talking about numerology and astrology, she said, I got letters, nasty letters. People aren't going to come listen to you talk about numerology. Well, getting a phone call from a homicide detective, and certainly they're listening to me. So you see, ask yourself, what prevents me from going forward? What can I do today? And what I did, I made a plan. I gave my boss one year's notice, and I made myself a promise I'm moving back to California, I'm going back to what I love, what I'm passionate about, and I visualized myself actually moving out of my house and crossing Colorado, California, and saw great things happening. It became my momentum. And so, no more shoulda, coulda, wouldas. Anyone here is new to all this. So you're all pretty much conscious about consciousness. So this is, right? So what, anyone in fear of anything? <laughs> Meaning, raise your hand. Because we all live by fear, do we not? And so I learned to let go of the fear, to walk through these challenges, to, you know, it's like, you can do this, Peter. You can do this. You can do this. Look what happened to me. I died. And look, I came back. Nothing changed but my entire life. <laughs> and frankly, I didn't care what the detective said. You know, when, the, when I was solving my, my crimes, when I was working with uh, the spirits that had passed on, they were always there in light. You know, our television, our, our media makes the paranormal world look like, ooh, you know, evil, evil, evil. You know, that's not what I saw. What I saw were spirits wanting to go back to the light. Think about that. Everything begins with the light and ends with the light. When you go through the light and you come back, you're surrounded by light, and they are no different. And that became my new world. So I'm going to do something here. I want every woman to stand up in this auditorium right now. Every woman to stand up. Every woman to stand up. Thank you. When I was crossing over, when I was crossing over and I made the choice, do you want to go back? Do you want to go back? All around me, light fragments of energy, of feminine consciousness. I write about this in the book. And what I saw were all these souls, female souls, who made the choice to go back and to go to different parts of the world to make a difference on the planet. For thousands of years, century after century after century, women have been left behind, have watched men go off to war. And I watch this in my life review. It is your time now. It, let me repeat this, it is your time now. I saw that on the other side. And it's not about politics, it's not about right or wrong, it's about elevated consciousness because a woman will think twice before she sends her boy off to war or her girl off to war. And when you see on the other side what I saw, the travesties of war, when you really break it down, it's ego and greed and profit is what it comes down to in war. We no longer need war. We need peace, we need harmony, we need kindness. And that is why you are here. Now, stand up, continue. Are any young people here? I need you to come forward. Any young people, 20s, 30s, you're young, come here. Come, come, come. Don't be afraid. Stand right here, right here. I want you to give them a round of applause, and I'm gonna tell you why. I have traveled for two years. Everywhere I have gone, where's Barbara? When we in Santa Barbara, we had an auto term on one side of college students. Where's Chuck? Where, when I was in Phoenix, one side of college students. You guys right here, when I write about, are the savior generation. You don't care about black, white, gay, straight, rich, poor. You care about education. You care about the environment. You care about the future. And this, my folks, is the savior generation. They are going to do it. So give them a round of applause because they deserve it. And every man in this auditorium, stand up. Every man, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Thank you for allowing this consciousness to come forward because you know what? It does take a simple, go out, honey, and do your thing. And I support you, right? 
So God bless you. Thank you. All of you, I cannot, cannot thank you enough for showing up today. It means the world to me. And especially when I got a letter just recently from a lit agent who said, your books will never sell and people will not come and listen to you speak. Don't bother. I wish I could snap photo this and send it to her and said, hello. So thank you for showing up today. It means the world to me. God bless you. Go out and do your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thank you. Thank you. You are guys are it. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. Okay. Um, open up for questions, I guess. Why do some spirits not go to the light? Why do they Trapped. stay? It's a simple question. You know, I'm going to give you a scientific breakdown of how it works. It's just real easy. And what do you suggest? Okay. So when I show up on a case, whether it's a homicide case or whether it's, you know, a paranormal investigation, they're cases, they're, they're sightings. We are energy. Got it? Let's say there was a murder in a restaurant. That energy is deposited there forever. That last moment of life is nothing more than energy. Got it? And I don't care if you build a grocery store. I don't care if you tear the grocery store down and build an apartment complex. I don't care if you tear down the apartment complex and build a church over it. That energy is there. And if that troll is trapped and cannot go back to the light, it's going to create activity because it wants to go back towards the light. So what I do, and I don't like to use the phrase ghost whisper, but that's what I was doing. I was whispering to the ghost. They were the ones that, you know, when I walk into a crime scene and they'd sit over there and mind you, when I'm working on television shows, I would tell the production crew, okay, we're shooting here at 12 o'clock. Ghosts don't come out at 12 o'clock noon. They come out at nighttime. So this is all wrong. Two, you know, I know you're sounding, you know, you're, 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 we're here for mics and we're testing for light and all that. Do you think the ghosts are sitting back there having coffee waiting for you to get your stuff together? <laughs> they don't work that way. So when I showed up, they learned I was a one-take any. When I show up on a crime scene, when I show up on a, on a television show working on a paranormal case, I show up, I do my walkthrough, you guys walk with me, we catch it on camera now because the ghosts are ready. That's how I operate. So back to the question, they are trapped and it is my job to help them go back towards the light by communicating and freeing up that energy. That energy will always stay there. That's why you have hauntings. You know, I worked on a cave, a haunted cave that, I don't know if you know the Bellwitch Cave or not, but it's been haunted since the 1800s, since Andrew Jackson. But I went on this case and everything they wrote in the history book was all wrong. They refused to show it because my story of what happened versus what was in the history books didn't match, didn't correspond. And I said, I'm sorry, but the man here murdered his slaves. They're buried right here. Uh, the, the owner of the property forbid his son for being a part of the family because he was gay and he abused his daughter. And the Trail of Tears, they found this cave and all these Indians died in this cave. There was a lot of paranormal activity there. I couldn't just go in there like my magic wand and clear, 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 clear. It doesn't work that way. And also the people in the house basically took the remains of the, of the shaman's young boy and put it in the closet and they were charging $5 a head to go into the cave, so the ghosts had to get active. So they're there for a reason. Don't fear them. You know, the only thing you have to fear, if there's something demonic, then that's a little different. That calls for a hierarchy of, 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 of experts. What is your question? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that you've risen to the challenge because you are a very dynamic and inspiring speaker. So you Well, thank you very much. Great. You know, those who, the facilitators that are here, no, I don't like to be on a podium. I like to get out and mingle with my audience because I want to look at your eyes, I want to touch your shoulders, I want to touch your hands because you guys, when you come here, you're here for reasons. You come here seeking. And it's my job to today, or whoever you see today or, or, or this past week, you want to go away with answers. You want to feel like, I got something out of this, right? And I did. Yeah. Okay, so what did you get? Uh, so, well, here's my question. Sure. All right. Um, it's kind of a paranormal normal question. I have been tired for probably about five years. And uh, one of the speakers here that I had a workshop with yesterday said that I have this spirit. When's your he, birthday? Uh, March 2nd. Pisces. And uh, she said, you've got this spirit, like this child attached to you, and it's kind of leeching off of you, and that's what's making you tired. And if that's true, how do I get rid of it? Okay, well, it's not that you get rid of it. First of all, 
we'll all have stories. First of all, Pisces. Mm -hmm. How many here are Pisces? Just raise your hand. Or water signs, Scorpio, Pi don't go away. Okay. Um, Pisces, Scorpio, Cancer, raise your hands high. Well, the water signs here are the sensitives, mm -hmm. the hypersensitives. Mm -hmm. So you could have walked into a, a murder, didn't even know something was there, and the entity could have attached itself to you. You don't know that. Right. Anything could happen. But Pisces are the sponges. Is it on your left side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So what's happening here, this is the solar plexus area through here. This is your psychic zone. You are ruled by the color yellow. Got it? Okay. So what you have to do, you have to balance that yellow out. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Okay. So where do you live? In Atlanta, Georgia. Do you have an aquarium there? Um, in Atlanta, yes. Yeah, I mean yes. a large aquarium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your homework assignment is I want you to go. Do you like headphones? Do you like earbuds? Yes. Do you like your favorite music? What would your favorite music be? Um, all kinds. I mean, uh, but calm. I want you to find something that calms your okay. spirit down. Okay? okay. I want you to go to this aquarium. Okay. And what we're going to do, we're going to balance your chakras. And what you're going to do, you're going to take. You're over riddled with a lot of yellow, Pisces, Cancer, Scorpio. Got it? Because you receive information. You're the psychic sponge. You overload, and it tends to attach itself to this part of the body: the hands, the feet, the stomach area. Okay. Pisces, Scorpio, Pisces. Mm -hmm. Got it? Go in, sit in that aquarium. If you can find a place to sit down and just let yourself go, and I guarantee, as we say back home in Texas, that thing will go away. Why? Because you're balancing out your chakras. Okay. You're overloaded. You know, what just, I'm trying to do, you're trying there. to take the blue, okay. the indigo, oh, okay. and you're trying to move it down away from the yellow. Okay. And blue is healing. Okay. And you're predominantly, when I see you, you're all yellow. Okay. And the, the next homework assignment, I want you to go in in either purple or blue, or royal blue. Let those colors work for you. I do that with my abused children. When children come to see me as clients mm -hmm. and they come with abusive backgrounds or they've been mishandled proper, improperly, right. I go through that with them. And it works. You have to find out where you most identify. You know, are you okay. an intellectual? Are you a sensitive? You know, are you more logical? Are mm -hmm. you more right brain, left brain? That's how I work with my clients. Because okay. my job is to free up at all these, what I call these little hang-ons. Okay. Okay? okay? Try it. I promise you this. You know, you'll see a big difference of what's going to happen. Okay. Let it go. Release it. Okay. You're there to do your homework assignment. The actual ritual that you're doing, mm -hmm. you're making a commitment to do it. Think about that. So already you're elevating your consciousness. Okay. And when you go there and do the exercise, watch what happens. I learned that from the shaman Indian. They gave me three months to live. You know, when you're at the, the you know, right. the last house on the block and you have no other choices, you do some pretty weird things. Go be weird. So I'm just going to go sit at the aquarium in like the... In your, head, areas, your, earbuds, your earbuds and go have fun okay. and just meditate and release, okay? okay. Please do. Right, questions, you. questions. Yes, come up. Oh. We're, done. We're done. Oh, We're done. okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Anyway, I'm we, going we to the library. Run? Oh, sorry. Let me, I'm going to cut off real quick here because this is important. They're here for reasons. I'm going to the library. I've sold out of books, unfortunately. I have cards you can order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever. Uh, I also, I think, um, Kimberly brought c uh, CDs from Seattle. My lecture's there. Listen, they're in the bookstore, excuse me. Go, 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 okay? And if you have any questions, I'm going to the library and I'll meet you over there, okay?